Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's Bridge Lunch Break event, Bridge Michigan's um, Michigan's Disappearing Winters. Uh, my name is Jackie Garrett, Fund Development Associate at Bridge Michigan, your source for nonprofit, nonpartisan news in Michigan. In this hour, we'll discuss Michigan's disappearing winters and the impact on our environment, culture, and recreation. Today, our special guest panelists will include Tyler Bouchore, Cultural Activities Coordinator for the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians, Professor Nancy Langston, Distinguished Professor of Environmental History at Michigan Tech University, and Richard B. Rood, Professor Emeritus, uh, Climate and Space Science and Engineering at University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Bridge Michigan's Kelly House will moderate this discussion. You can read full bios of our panelists on the event page, and we'll drop a link to that page in the chat as well. Um, our conversation will begin in just a moment, and Kelly will lead the discussion with Tyler, Nancy, and Richard for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll turn to your questions. Please type any questions you have for our panelists into the chat window at any time. If you're not a panelist, please remain muted throughout today's discussion. We are recording today's conversation and it will be posted on Bridge Michigan this week. You can subscribe to our newsletters by visiting www.bridgemi.com and click subscribe. Events like this one are made possible by the support of Bridge members. If you'd like to join this membership community, we'll also drop a link to do so in the chat. A reminder, again, please stay muted throughout the conversation. I'll now pass it over to Kelly to get us started. Thanks, Jackie. And thanks to our panelists and viewers for being here. Um, I want to start with Richard. Uh, you have studied the, the changes that are happening with our climate in the North and globally. Can you describe the changes that we're seeing to our winters in this part of the world right now? Sure. When you look at the earth warming and warming, the accumulation of heat is the most definitive thing that um, is occurring. One of the things that is happening is that winter is getting warmer faster than the other seasons um, in Michigan, the Great Lakes, and in large portions of the world, <clears throat> eastern half of the United States. This is really due to what I would call the accumulation of heat, which um, this year is um, particularly prominent for a lot of people because the oceans, um, specifically, and the Atlantic are both extraordinarily warm, which is capturing a lot of people's attention. But this is just a continuing trend. Um, since the year 2000, um, it's been very notable noticeable in the Great Lakes region, um, the decline of uh, ice on the lakes um, and um, the changing in characteristics of wintertime precipitation. So this is just a manifestation of, of global warming, really. And uh, I talked to you for a recent story that I did on this, and you helped paint a picture of how that warming will look as it continues in the future. Um, yes. Can you look some of that out for us? Yes, I mean, so one of the things that I think, you know, th this will continue. Um, this is something that um, we are really committed to seeing for many, many decades. And, you know, what will happen um, is, you know, a number of things. One, I think there will be a continued reduction of of ice on um, both you know, internal lakes as well as the Great Lakes. Um, one of the things that makes for a big change is that where it used to freeze uh, very reliably for all of December, January, February, and March, um, we now see temperatures above freezing. And that means that what I would describe as the line of freezing you know, between um, frozen and unfrozen precipitation is changing. And because precipitation um, itself goes from rain to ice and sleet, to freezing rain, um, to wet snow, to dry snow, um, which has, you know, all of those things have a very different character 
Um, one of the big changes you see is the freezing line sort of moves to the north and perhaps to the west as well, is that some regions will become essentially snow free. Um, and as that line moves, um, we'll see things like freezing rain becoming more common, um, which you know, has huge disruptions, for example, on forests and roads. And then, um, the, as I said, this heat will continue um, for decades. Um, as long as there's a lot of water around, which we have, and we get a lot of our moisture in the Great Lakes, actually in the Gulf of Mexico, um, I expect the winters will be quite wet and then there will be you know, changes in the cadence or the seasonal rhythm of runoff into the lakes and into the rivers and streams. Thank you. And I imagine everyone on this call is aware of this winter as sort of a proxy for that. It was uh, record warmth you know, an absence of snow in many parts of the state that are used to it. And um, Tyler and Nancy, you both live in parts of the state that are considered, you know, emblematic of Michigan winter and where people, you know, we have all of this culture connected to the existence of that season. So I want to ask both of you, um, just how important winter is in your mind to our identity as a state, and Tyler, I know for you, you know, you are a cultural expert within the Sioux tribe. So can you talk about its importance to tribal identity? And I guess I'll start with Tyler and then go to Nancy. Yeah. Um, uh, first, I want to say um, to say cultural expert um, in my eyes would be um, a little bit disrespectful because I'm not an elder. I, I am a younger man. Um, so I, I don't want to use the word expert in, in any way. I'm, I'm always continuously learning. Um, we don't, we don't really believe in, in experts in our way. Um, but as far as, as the winter goes for, for us, you know, that's our time for us to be able to tell our stories and everything that's related to our stories. It's where our origins come from. It's, it's everything that embodies us um, in our learning and um, we can tell from these stories uh, of how to continuously grow as people. Um, it teaches us lessons and, and it's all of our histories are all tied within that. And for us, we don't um, tell those stories unless there's snow on the ground and, and it's winter time. Um, for us, that's, that's the time that, our, that um, the spirits rest. So that's the time that we, we tell those stories. And, and if there's no snow on the ground and, and we have those, those that like no winter, then we're not able to, to do those things. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of this year, uh, we, we normally have sugar bush at this time. Um, I, I would be over on Sugar Island right now, hauling maple syrup and, and maple sap and, and getting that ready for, for our, our community here. And we weren't able to do that because of the, of how warm it was we noticed that our maple trees were starting to bud um in january and for us when that tree buds then then we're done so we didn't even get it to a point where um we were able to actually to go and tap the trees it was months and months before we would even look at tapping normally we're, we're not tapping until um right around this time maybe maybe a week ago we would have um and we, we just weren't able to do anything um, from that standpoint. And also our, our winter games that we normally play, um, we, we do snow snake games. Um, in our community this year, we didn't have the snowfall in order to build our track to play our game. So we had to cancel that event. So really with, with this warming uh, of temperatures and not getting the weather, um, it's really affecting us as a community. Um, it's hurting us in our ability to gather and come together. Um, it's our time to listen to our elders share our stories and it creates that bond and that, and that's what we need as a community. We're, we're so um, hurting for that as our community. We, we always want that elder presence. And when you don't have that time that's dedicated, like we do um, during those winter months, that December, January, February, and March, when we don't get that, we kind of hurt for that because we're losing that, that elder interaction and that elder time. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, thanks, Tyler. That really resonates with me. This is the first time in well over a decade that my husband and I weren't able to tap our, our tiny little sugar bush um, because, as you say, the, the, the buds appeared so early. Um, and there are lots and lots of ways. I live on the Keweenaw Peninsula, which is that peninsula that juts out into Lake Superior, teach at Michigan Tech, um, and just small things that have been really integral to our community, which is a mixture of downstate, people from the local area. We have a plurality of Finnish Americans. We have a really substantial and you know deeply important Anishinaabe community. And then people like me who came here um, or came to the Midwest about 30 years ago now. And for all of us, we chose to be in this area in part because of the winters. I always joke my husband and I were climate refugees, the first in the region. He was a small scale organic farmer down in Southern Wisconsin where I taught at the forestry school there. And he was growing soft berry fruits um, organically, basically raspberries and strawberries. Easy to do that in a cold Midwestern winter because those cold winters kill all the funguses. Much, much harder to do possible, but harder. Um, once we have warm winters. And I think there's a key message there. We're humans, we're adaptable with our more than human partners, such as sturgeon or the reindeer and caribou I work on. We figured out in the past over and over again how to adapt to changing climates. But it takes time and we're seeing, we're really being whipsawed right now, if that's a verb. We're seeing these dramatic changes so quickly. So say our tech undergrads and grad students who are amazing, they come from all over the world. And winter carnival has been key to getting through the winters here. You know, it started as a way of just making it through the winters and it's become so important. And the students are adapting, but they're hauling in snow from elsewhere. Our ski races are really, really critical to who we are. And I was out training for the Great Bear Chase, one of our late season citizen ski races. And I hit a stick um, that was sticking up out of the ground, completely my fault but you know, dislocated my hip. And so not just was the ski race canceled because there wasn't enough snow. My entire winter was canceled because of um, hitting the ice wrong. But the larger, I think, story here is that so many of our cultural rituals help to define who we are. The Berkey in the upper Midwest, you know, it celebrated its 50th year anniversary, one of the longest citizen endurance ski races in the world modeled after the Norwegian ski races. And they, you know, they didn't have any snow. So they hauled in snow from all over the Midwest and had this little ribbon. You had to ski around and around like hamsters in a cage. And so they retain part of that. But boy, trying to adapt to this is the challenge we're all going to have to figure out together. That makes me wonder, um, Tyler, you were just talking specifically about, you know, many of these stories only happen when there's snow on the ground or certain things that are triggered by the presence of winter. You know, Nancy, you also mentioned these recreational traditions that rely on snow and the topic of adaptation came up. Um, I'm curious, Tyler, are there discussions or are you thinking, you know, about what it means if those annual traditions are repeatedly threatened by absence of snow or ice or, you know, the triggering weather that we expect to be here every year and that now we're, we're not seeing all the time. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, you know, we talk about it a lot in our stories and, and in the in the teachings that were given, um, this isn't the time or place to, to say our teachings, but in those teachings, we talk about that things are changing and, and we have an understanding of that change that happens. So even within our, our stories and our teachings and, and as we're doing our ceremonies and, and continuously talking to the elders, we understand that that we are adaptable people and that things are going to change. And sometimes we are going to have to adapt and change to the things that we are doing. Um, it may not look the same as it was when I was younger. It may have to be something totally different, but we will adapt and we will change um, in order for us not to lose the things that, that we hold so near and dear to us. Thanks. And I want to go back to um, Richard 
so, you know, climate scientists are almost unanimous in their uh, understanding that the world is warming and that humans, you know, human activity is driving that. I know that as a journalist, I still hear fairly frequently from people who do not believe that. Um, and I think one of the things that can be particularly difficult when talking about warming and how it affects winter in Michigan is that we have always had some erraticness in our winter, you know, really polar vortexes followed by mild winters, um, you know, ice that varies from year to year. Um, can you kind of help explain how you find a trend line in that erraticness and and why you know the presence still of some extreme winters doesn't negate the climate trends that you're seeing? I'll do my best. So if you look at winter in particular, um, when you have a warm, especially warm winter in Michigan, um, it has always been due to the transport of heat by weather systems um, from further south. And when you have an especially cold outbreak in Michigan, um, this is because of cold Arctic air um, inside of what is now popularly known as the polar vortex polar vortex being displaced over winter. And so these sort of weather uh, phenomena, these weather features um, have a, you know, a lot of variability associated with them. They, they also are guided um, at times by things, you know, larger weather scales of like El Nino or El Nino. And um, something called the Arctic Oscillation, which is a measure of how much the vortex bounces around. So you can do it as a measure of, of cold air outbreaks. I think what's important to notice is that, uh, you know, if we talk about the record low ice of this year, um, you know, one year ago in 2023, uh, we were also doing stories about record low ice. And if you look at a place like I've studied Apostle Islands, um, since the, the year 2000, um, the presence of the ice on the lake that allows them to have their ice caves um, has become very unreliable. And so those ice caves are no longer accessible to people. And then when we start looking around, what you see now is that the water temperature in the lakes, there's a big trend. It's actually increasing faster than it is on land. You see this winter after winter. And then when you look around the globe, you see the, uh, again, the, the effects of the warming seas. And, and so when you start to get into that, that issue of variability, we still have variability. We still have at this point, the same sort of weather behavior we've had before, but it's on this background of accumulating heat and for the most part, uh, increasing temperatures. So it requires you to you know, imagine that perhaps you're in a flooding river or something, but you still have a windstorm on top of that that will, will, will you know, potentially push the water up even more. Uh, so uh, you, you have to, I, I believe, uh, embrace this idea of both a trend and variability on top of that trend. And we still have that variability. So there is no reason um, to anticipate that each winter or that you could not find counterfactuals that there was one winter. It is this sort of year after year. And then if you look at an average over a decade, each decade is warmer than the previous decade for the last 40 to 50 years. And that difference is accelerating. 
Yeah, thanks, Richard. I think that's a really key point and often really hard for us to understand because I think as individuals, we know the world through experiences and we know the world through stories and trying to, you know, for example, last um, May, I was in Duluth for Climate in the Great Lakes Conference organized by University of Minnesota Duluth. And when we walked along the lake, there were still big ice shelves, basically icebergs with all sorts of folks in bikinis running around on the ice because it was an 80 some degree day. Um, and that's such a striking image for us. It's thinking, wow, it's really warming. This is just, it's just so intense. But as many of my colleagues keep reminding me, one really hot day doesn't mean that we're witnessing climate change because there's a lot of variability. It's those trends over decades from direct temperature measurements, over centuries from indirect measurements, and over millennia that we can measure through what are called proxies. Um, so there are lots and lots of different kinds of data sources coming together, but there's also the richness of our own individual experience, seeing the sled dog races canceled, not just this year, but last year, year after year. And that's how we begin to put these individual observations into a broader sort of set of scientific observations that substantiate our concerns about profound climate change affecting us. I'm curious for uh, the two youpers on the call, and Richard, you might have thoughts too for, for the rest of the state, but um, I was up your way reporting a story on this, and I heard a lot from folks up there about the economic impact and how important winter tourism and recreation um, is not just culturally, but economically for the UP. And I'm curious if either if either of you have thoughts on just what this winter has meant for the UP's economy and what you've noticed on the ground. Um, I can speak a little bit about it from from my perspective and what I've seen this year. Um, so so where I am, I, I, I live in Sault Ste. Marie. So um, we noticed that this year the, the snowmobile trails uh, weren't able to be groomed uh, and kept up the way that they normally would um, and, and run. So everything um, west of me, uh, Brimley and, and that area, um, they were able to keep their trails open because they got a little bit more snow than we did. But on the eastern side here in the eastern upper peninsula, we, we weren't able to, to maintain that. But one thing that they were able to do, which is a, a huge um, thing economically for us, is have the I-500 snowmobile race. Mm -hmm. and they were still able to, to maintain the track and get the track um, able to, to hold that race. So, so that part of our, our economy was, was still able to, to um, flourish. But... Um, I don't know exactly if they were able to do all their the other races that they normally do, or if it was just the the big primary race. I, I didn't pay attention too much, um, but I know that that's a big thing that that's always on our mind. If if the winter doesn't happen, then um, that I five hundred race is is very very big for us in this area. Yeah, um, an earlier article in Bridge, Michigan mentioned some figures uh, um, from halfway through the winter, late February, I believe, where our winter tourism was only one fifth of what was expected, 36 million instead of 180 million in the UP. And that we have so many so-called mom and pop businesses. We don't have a lot of big, huge chains. And you know, one bad winter, they might be able to absorb bad winter after bad winter because each snowmobiler that comes up, each downhill skier, cross country skier, they of course have a multiplier effect in the community because they're not just coming and buying gas, they're staying in lodging, they're eating at restaurants, they're going to bars, they're doing all sorts of stuff with us, going to music. And so all of those effects multiply. And again, we can help you know, sustain that kind of resiliency. Our economies don't have to collapse, but we really do have to figure out how to adapt. How have the two of you adapted, if you have, on a personal <laughs> level? Because I imagine, you know, living up there, um, you probably have your own personal winter traditions or ways that you go about these few months and it's been different. So. How have your behaviors changed? I've skied 25 days this winter instead of my normal 95 days, but that's partly because I was a klutz and had a bad fall, dislocated my hip. But, um, you know, I bought little ice cleat 
boots so I could walk with my friend every day because there's so much more ice and it's so much scarier. Um, so I'm adapting by walking instead of skiing every day. Going to get those kayaks out um, next week, probably. You know, instead of ice fishing, you go kayak fishing. Tyler and Richard, how about you? You pray. Um, for me, um, when I think about uh, adapting or, or trying to adapt to things, I, I I always think about my work because that's primarily we go by the seasons. And and in my work I, as a cultural activities coordinator, my job is to bring workshops um, out to the community. So what we ended up doing um, is we we ended up having more workshops and so more teaching. So we were bringing people into the area. Um, that maybe wouldn't have had the opportunity to come here and teach uh, because again, we, during this time, we're normally on sugar bush. So we're bringing everybody over to sugar Island um, to, and show them how to tap and, and how we process. So for us, we were able to bring in um, some, some different teachers and to have different workshops um, in my personal life. Um, it, I mean, my work life overloads my personal life. So it's kind of hard to, to say um, I didn't have to shovel as much this year. So that was that part was kind of nice. Um, but other than that, as far as my personal life, um, everything was essentially the same. I have two young ones at home. So I'm at home as soon as it's it's time to go home, cook dinner and, and just relaxing. So my personal life was, was kind of the same. Your anecdote about not having to shovel as much makes me want to ask, um, and I'll open this up to anyone, and I'm, I'm curious too, Richard, if you have thoughts, but are there any upsides, you know, beyond less shoveling? We've talked a lot about the societal, you know, the need we're going to have to to change um, how we view winter and our lives, but are there benefits there are absolutely benefits. And if we deny those benefits, then we lose a lot of credibility with meeting people where they are. So as I've been in crutches for a chunk of this winter, I've realized there's some benefits from not, you know, it's treacherous for people with certain disabilities. The snow can be, but more broadly, um, you know, the wheat yields are, are improving in our region. I mean, in many measures, it's going to be better for certain aspects of agriculture. There is going to be increased ice-free shipping days, which of course comes with risks, as we saw in Baltimore, unfortunately, um, this past week. There'll be decreased heating costs. And for many, many people in our communities, heating costs are such a huge chunk of their budgets. You know, more warm water fish, such as bass, fewer cold water fish, such as lake trout. And I'm not at all suggesting, oh, everything will be great. I am suggesting the costs and benefits for warming are going to be distributed unequally. Um, so we really need to, I personally think, do whatever we can to slow fossil fuel emissions. But I also think we need to do whatever we can to make sure those um, that these costs aren't all focused on the poor among us so that everybody has a chance to adapt. And you know, pay for better insulation, for example, that will reduce cooling costs in the summer, which are going to be a big challenge. So I'll I'll pick up on that a little bit. Um, I think uh, one of the big things that people will notice is, as as Nancy said, the, the reduction of, of winter heating bills and the fuel demands. But I think an important thing to remember is that we are just at the beginning of this. Um, we are um, not, say, at what we might call a new normal, uh, where we can now adjust to this. We are at the beginning of a time of quite significant change. And so, one, it will be challenging um, to you know, how do we adapt to something that, that's really, really changing? So that's going to be tough. We, we have to adapt to change. But if we do not ultimately do a mitigation of the carbon dioxide and methane release and limitless warming, uh, we're likely to go through a time when the warming in the winter and warming in general um, you know, it seems to have a lot of benefits. Um, but then as it gets warmer, 
what it's going to do is it's going to change the relationship with moisture because evaporation and drying will ultimately become um, amplified and accelerated. So it's, um, I think it's important not to think um, of this. You know, there are many benefits that are potentially realized by people. Um, I, I wrote once that I had never talked to anyone in Michigan who said that a warmer winter was not a good thing. Uh, and, and there's still an awful lot of people um, who say, hey, this is, this is nicer than it used to be. So but I think this whole idea that we're at the beginning of a period of quite rapid change is important to keep in mind. So I want to raise um, the topic of El Nino because this is an El Nino year. Um, I know that I'm talking with climatologists, including folks on this call, you know, um, El Nino plays a role, but, you know, I've heard some, some debate about how strong that role is and, and what it means in the context of this extremely warm winter. But can... Nancy or Richard, um, can you speak to what role El Nino does or doesn't play and what we can attribute to El Nino versus climate change? Um, I'll jump in, but I'm sure Richard actually knows more about this. So El Ninos are, and so um, to be technical, are indeed part of our global climate system. And they have historically occurred I mean, on average about two to seven years apart, 3.8 years as a median, but so they happen. Um, they are strengthening, it appears from the record. Again, this is not absolutely certain, but they're strengthening in part because the uh, sea surface temperatures in a particular region of the Pacific Ocean that really affect us because of continental currents this winter, they've been about three degrees Fahrenheit above normal. Might, might sound like a lot, but that's huge given how big the ocean is. And so these warmer ocean temperatures can really affect trade, what it used to be called trade winds, lead to potentially stronger El Nino effects in our region. So two key things. One, yes, this is in large part an El Nino year. We don't have to expect this every year in the future. Um, El Nino is a so-called natural non anthropogenic event, but human choices, human fossil fuel emissions are changing the intensity and potentially the frequency, that's not as clear, of El Nino effects on our region. And El Nino is not the only thing going on this winter. So how's that for a complicated answer? And I'll, I'll add to that. Um... In, in my last answer, I talked about this idea that we have a trend and um, not only do we have that trend, we continue to have variability on top of that trend. If you look at El Nino for, so what El Nino is, is a, is a warming in the Eastern Pacific. Um, there is something called La Nina, which is a cooling in the Eastern Pacific. And the El Nino um, times um, have always been a time when the planet is warmer. Um, so it, it is a big enough event that it affects the planetary temperature um, up generally to about a couple of degrees. Um, it has some effect globally in, on the weather. Um, the, effect of the Great Lakes is generally smaller compared to a number of other places. I think what I'd like to say here is you look at El Nino from about the mid 80s on, every time we have an El Nino, the temperature goes up a couple of degrees and then it steps back about one degree during the La Nina. So it's not stepping all the way back any and so you're seeing the El Nino almost acting as an accelerant of the trend um, globally at this point. And if you were to look in you know, the newspapers and, and now 
starting to emerge in the, in the science journals, um, you would see um, what's often called an, uh, an alarm um, that many scientists are talking about is that this El Nino so far this year is not stepping back very much. Um, the temperatures in the ocean have been record warm for many months now. And usually by this time, it's starting to step back um, to take that one step, you know, that one degree back. And so I think, again, one of the things we're seeing here is this accumulation of heat. And I think that's even going to include that the behavior of El Nino and its um, our intuition about what it means to weather um, in a place like Michigan is changing because honestly, the pattern of the sea surface temperatures um, globally are, are changing. Thank you. And um, I see several reader questions that um, kind of dovetail with a question that I was going to ask. So I'm going to try to combine them. And it, it's really people saying, you know, we've talked a lot about how humans are impacted, how our what we like to do and how we view place are impacted. Uh, but there are fish and wildlife impacts. There are, you know, impacts to our landscapes themselves and which trees grow where. Um, I'll just open this up to all of you because I'm not sure who's best positioned on this and you may all have thoughts, but beyond our experience of weather, what do you see as some of the big impacts to our environment writ large? Um, I'll jump in because my last couple of books have been on wildlife impacts from climate change in the upper Great Lakes Basin. And I currently work on caribou and reindeer migrations around the world. Um, in the upper Great Lakes, we used to have one of the most abundant of all the deer family in our region were not white-tailed deer, which are most abundant now. They weren't moose. It was woodland caribou. Now we just have a very small herd persisting on the north shore of Lake Superior. And there's huge efforts by the Michipicotan First Nations community, the Ontario Ministry, to try and restore that population so they can reconnect with the historic migrations up to Hudson's Bay. Um, and we're seeing things like that, people working on lake trout populations and lake sturgeon. These are animals that are incredibly important to our cultures, but also incredibly important to the web of ecosystems that make up our home. Um, and for many of these wildlife, um, they have the potential to be resilient, either with our help or without our help, to migrate to places that offer better habitat for them in a changing world. Um, and so part of, I think, our responsibility is not just to ensure that the world's largest supply of fresh surface water, the Great Lakes, 21% of the world's water, and the most important resource, I would venture to guess, in a warming world, fresh water, um, that the, these Great Lakes are of core importance, not just for human communities, but for every aspect of our broader ecological communities of our wildlife, you know, more than human partners. Um, so anything we can do to help sustain them, I think ultimately helps sustain ourselves, but even more importantly, from my perspective, helps to sustain the incredible flourishing, blooming, buzzing potential of earth that I don't think we have a right to devastate. And I'm really glad you're, that our listeners ask those questions, because I think it's super, super valuable to always reflect on what this means, not just for ourselves, but for the entire world that we're embedded within. I can uh, jump in here as well. Um, you know, for, for us and, and the way that we view uh, winter time for, for our plants and animals, um, mainly thinking about plant life here is that um, it's their time to rest for us, for all of our medicines to take a break to where we're not asking or relying on them to help us in any way. It's their time to get a break, just like you and I would need a break to, to sit down and, and just have that minute um, to ourselves to, to recoup and, and rethink about everything. The plant life needs that as well. 
And so for those plants to not have that time, you know, I'm thinking about the maple trees this year when they're, when they're budding in January, it, it brings a confusion to that plant of about what it's supposed to do and what its jobs are here to do. It, it has that cycle that it typically follows every single year when it comes springtime, then it's time to, to start taking in that nutrition and, and all of everything that's, um, that has to do with the plant life it's all in that cycle and it's almost like that that cycle is is being broken early and it's confusing the plants and so for us it, it it's almost like we like that one of the main things that we focused on a, a, as our tribal community when we decided not to do sugar bush this year was that we went and we talked to the trees and let them know that we understand that this is confusing and, and we want to give you your time and, and not hurt you and not harm you and so we wanted to give that to them as, as that plant life. Um, so that's what I think about when I, when I think about our plant life and our animal life. It, it, it's very confusing for them to, to have to deal with this. I, I also want to stress that climate change is one among many impacts on wildlife and plant communities around us. And we do have the potential to act to reduce climate change impacts in the future, increase resiliency now. But we can also take actions right now to reduce some of the other human cost stressors. One example are the whitefish, which are incredibly important in Lake Superior. We have some of the world's most rich and abundant spawning grounds in the world, one in particular off the coast of the Keweenaw called Buffalo Reef. And white you know, whitefish populations are you know, experiencing a lot of impacts from climate change, some actually beneficial in the short term because reduce um, slightly warmer temperatures, but others negative changing ice cover affects spawning. But the big thing that's affecting whitefish is the fact that we dumped billions of tons of mining waste that, you know, just north of it, and it's made its way with Lake Superior Currents to start covering the spawning grounds. And this is something we can fix now. It's not cheap, it's not easy. Tribes and state partners and scientists have been partnering for you know over a decade to figure out what to do. And we're finally doing it. It's costing millions upon millions of dollars. But that's an action if we say, oh, it's all, ah, we can't do anything, it's climate change. That lets us, off, lets us off the responsibility for right now making decisions to go and get that mining waste off the spawning reef. And there are lots and lots of examples of things like that. We have one reader who's asked a specific question on those changes. And I let me know if no one thinks they have um, a specific answer. I might have some thoughts I could share, but they're asking roughly how much has the growing season been extended in Southwest Michigan during the last several decades? and What's your guesstimate as to how it might be extended during the next 30 years or so? So their question is really specific to Southwest Michigan. I don't know if any of us have that much specificity, but can anyone speak to how our growing seasons will shift, have shifted and will shift in the future? Um, I can say Southeast Michigan. So the Detroit area, the growing season has it been extended by 29 days since the 1970s. Um, as of 2023. Um, and that was an article in Bridge, Michigan, actually, <laughs> that I found. But you say in Madison, where I lived for uh, almost 18 years, when I moved there, it was zone 4A. Any gardeners know what these terms mean? Basically, you could hardly plant. You had to be really careful what you planted because it got really cold in the winter. Now it's 5B here in the Keweenaw. Um, our growing zones by the USDA measures have have changed by two zones and that's out of one through eight. So that's what 20 some percent. So it's dramatically changing. Um, and for the specifics in Southwest Michigan, I'd be happy to you know look that up for folks if they want. So as a coincidence yesterday, I was in a discussion about Southwest Michigan um, and I'll just add to that. The growing season, you know, has um, increased, um, as Nancy described. And one of the interesting things that happened in Southwest Michigan um, this year during the, that January cold air outbreak 
is that the um, protection, um, that the air came from a more continental direction um, so that the protection that Lake Michigan offered, um, offers Southwest Michigan was lost. And so there was severe January damage um, to the fruit trees in Southwest Michigan. And I think this emphasizes another point that though the growing season has increased by a measure of perhaps when they're killing frosts, um, this variability, and then again, going back to what Tyler was saying, you know, what the trees are used to in their annual cycle is that um, there were a lot of trees that because of the very warm uh, December and January, uh, the, the buds were not in the shape that they normally are, that when that cold air outbreak um, occurred, there was a lot of damage. So there is a certain aspect of variability. I, I, I would call it the ragged edge between winter and spring, that the tears in that ragged edge um, are, are, are bigger than they used to be. So it's, it's a difficult problem to deal with that variability uh, of the growing season because you still have that potential of the cold air outbreaks. Thank you. And a couple people have asked a question about climate havens. Um, you know, some predict that although, of course, climate change is a global stressor. Um, the Great Lakes region may be more insulated in certain ways and may be experiencing people moving here because they're part of, you know, the part of the world where they came from is under maybe more dire stress. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do, do, you know, do you see that happening? Do you think that will happen? And what considerations might go into preparing for that if it is gonna happen. And I'll open that to anyone. I'm not sure who's might have thoughts. Yeah, I'd refer people to the amazing work of one of my PhD students, Julia Peterson, and um, another colleague here at Tech, uh, Professor Rochelle Winkler. They're doing also, or we're doing a whole set of work on that because as you say, there are a lot of predictions that the Great Lakes will become a climate refuge or a climate you know, haven in part because of our abundant um, surface water, and in part because the North is experiencing more rapid rates of increase in temperature. Um, so for example, Kentucky, I saw there was a question about Kentucky since 1950, temperatures have ridden, risen by 0 0.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's only a quarter of our average temperature increase in the Great Lakes. But still, you know, the the temperature predictions in Kentucky are less than here, but the effects on humans with a comfortable climate for humans are much more. But what Rochelle and Julia are finding is we are not yet seeing the kind of climate migration to the region that was predicted. People are picking up and moving after climate disasters, which are happening more and more and more in you know hurricane prone regions, tornadoes, the desert Southwest but people typically move one county or just two zip codes over. It's pretty rare for someone to uproot their whole family and say, hey, I'm gonna to move to Michigan. It happened back in the 1920s, 30s, during the second great migration um, when African-Americans left the South because of extraordinary um, prejudice. But it happened because people from Detroit went down to the South and said, hey, we have jobs for you. We have a haven. You can get away from prejudice. So if the upper Midwest wants to become a climate haven, we're going to have to look at basically letting people know, hey, moving to places with more jobs, such as Phoenix right now, might not be the best idea because Phoenix is going to be a place that's going to be really hard to sustain human life under current climate models without a huge you know, influx of basically air conditioning. But more importantly, we have to really think about infrastructure. How will we support these climate migrants? You know, and infrastructure is gonna be part of the answer, you know, better culverts, better highway systems, green infrastructure where we can 
absorb some of the changing precipitation before it runs off and brings sediments and you know potentially toxic chemicals into our clean water. So, and we need to think about better emergency services, as I found out the hard way, waiting for rescue. You know, that's a huge issue for our rural communities in remote places. Um, you know, and climate change also brings in the need for thinking about funding our ambulance services, thinking about funding better culverts. We had a Father's Day flood in 2018. That was a huge tragedy for the Kiwana. One child died um, quite tragically. Um, and the community really pulled together afterwards to rebuild. And yet we kept running into some FEMA rules where there's federal funding for rebuilding back to the standards when things blew out. But we need bigger culverts, not the culverts of the 1950s. And so, you know, the community leaders negotiated and we have put in some better culverts. But something as simple as culvert size can really bring together communities across partisan differences. You know, everybody can agree we need culverts that are gonna sustain future floods, not floods from five decades ago. But you can tell I'm at an engineering school if I wax poetic about culvert size. So I, I will just say anecdotally, um, a couple of things. One, I occasionally do get a letter from somebody who's who's contemplating that move to Michigan, um, and, and I try to answer them. Um, I think for ten or fifteen years um, there has been um, the emergence of this idea of migration to the area. I, I expect we will ultimately see some. Some cities are, in fact. Um, starting to develop policies in that direction. I think that um, one of the places from, from my observations that we have not actually considered enough in this equation so far is the psychology and the behavioral aspects of people's um, sense of place. There are people in sociology who study um, sense of place, you know, and I know personally I have a very strong, you know, place idea. And I think if we look historically, large migrations um, associated with weather and climate are most often associated with drought um, and the inability um, to maintain agriculture um, in the region. So, and you know, you have the obvious example of the Dust Bowl um, in the United States, and you know, potentially what's happening in uh, what's happened in Syria in the last few years. But of course, it's conflated with war and many other things. Um, so, I, I, I think I, I agree with everything Nancy said about infrastructure, um, and um, I, I think more and more people will. Um, find it, but I'm, I don't expect it's going to be mass movements of people, um, and at least in the next 10 or 15 years, you know, it's sort of, of, of huge um, groups of people, you know, um, people love the oceans, so... Yeah, we're in this moment right now, which I think was pointed out that, you know, the, the fastest growing states are like Florida, Arizona, states that have, are considered also some of the most climate hazardous. Yes. Tyler, do you have any thoughts on, you know, the concept of climate migration and the potential implications? Uh, not that I can think of. Well, I know that we are coming up on the hour. There are a couple of questions I still haven't gotten to, but I may leave it at that so that we are respectful of folks' time. Um, just want to thank all of the panelists and thanks folks for um, joining us and kick it back to my colleague, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, also, thank you, Tyler, Nancy, and Richard, as well as all of our guests here today. Um, I'd like to give you all 
recall a brief reminder that we'll be posting a recording of today's program on Bridge Michigan's website, app, and social media channels this week. Um, our April event will be announced very soon. You'll get a word about that um, in the coming weeks. Um, thank you all again. Have a great day um, and enjoy your spring. <laughs> um, thanks so much for hosting it. And thanks to all the members of the audience who posted such thoughtful questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them.